To begin, we'll hear the words of Psalm 117, the shortest psalm in the entire Bible. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. This is a tall pulpit. Is there a step? Well, I'll use that next week, maybe. <laughs> one of the things that, that we might wonder sometimes, one of these things, if we're being honest with ourselves, brothers and sisters in Christ, is whether people like us or not. And, and if we're being honest with ourselves, we might lose some sleep at night and wonder, did, did people like me or not? And that's, that's one of those things that, if we're honest with ourselves, we can talk about it. But sometimes we're, we're maybe some of those people that say, well, that's not a problem for me, right? And then we have that argument with the person that is nearest and dearest to us, that all and out row, right? And we go to bed at night and we lose sleep. We lose sleep because the very thing that we said that we weren't going to be thinking about is the thing we're thinking about, about the care, person that care, we care about the most. And also, we might change how our minds think about those things. We might couch it in different ways, right? Do people like me or not? Sometimes we, we may say, well, are they going to like the way I do things? Right? Are they going to like the way things happen? Or are they going to understand how I do things? And those are just other ways for us to say, will people like me? or not, right? Or, maybe the most subtle of them all, but it's pretty blunt in our own minds, are people going to be like me? And if they're like me, then, then they have to like me because we, we like all the same things, right? Will people like me? I think, I think that's a question maybe a congregation might ask of a new pastor, right? Will this new pastor like me? And it's a question that a pastor might ask of a new congregation. Well, these people like me. And it's a question that students ask when they're at school with their peers. Well, these people like me. It's a question that people who are working ask when they are with their peers at work. Well, people like me. It's a question that people ask when they're in their homes. Will people like me? And it's a question that scares us out of our minds when we ask it of God. Will God really like me? We've sinned. We're not perfect. We stand before a righteous and a holy God and we ask, will God really like me? And that sin, that, that leads us to insecurity as we ask that question of ourselves. And, and then there's that devil, the devil that's constantly prodding and poking and, and whispering in our ears. How could he possibly like you? How could he possibly like you? And, and when that happens to us, God does not leave us. He doesn't leave us in our sleeplessness. He does not leave us in our worry. But instead... He cries out through the prophet Isaiah in this reading, and, and he cannot wait to tell us about how he likes us, which is what we get in this reading from Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah 62 is, is God calling out to his people, and as he calls out to his people, we hear this word, Zion, you, Zion. And, and that's an Old Testament way of talking about all believers of all time. So he's talking about what we would confess in the creed is the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. And so he's talking to us in this reading. He's talking to all believers of all time. So as I read this reading again from Isaiah chapter 62, hear yourself in it and put yourself in it because he's talking to us and, and he answers that question, does God really like me? It's very clear. It's also printed in your bulletin. For Zion's sake, 
I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God, and no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. But you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. He can't wait. God can't wait to answer that question that, that's so pressing for his people. Does God really like me? Could he possibly like me? Am I one of the people that he likes? At the beginning, he just can't hold back his desire to tell his people. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. He can't help himself. He has to. He has to cry out. He has to talk about how much he likes his people. And not only that, but how he provides exactly what his people need. Because his people need righteousness. His people need salvation. And that's what God says he will provide for his people. Now, we were talking about how sin and its effects are with us in this world whether it's our own sin or someone else's sin, what sin shows us is that righteousness is something that, that we lack on our own. But Christ, he's righteous. He's completely righteous. He's our Savior. He's the, the Son of God. And Christ, our God, loves us so much that he gave us that righteousness. That is a free gift to us. He provided what we were lacking when he gave his righteous life for us in our place, when he died for us on the cross. But he didn't just die there to be punished like we should have been punished. No, no, he provided an entire salvation. He provided what we needed. And that's righteousness in God's eyes. And he gave it to us, free gift. Knowing that Jesus Christ is our Savior from sin and that God then can't wait to proclaim that. He can't wait to, to tell his people, look what I've given to you. I've given you what you need. I've given you righteousness. I've given you salvation. I have done it all. It's accomplished. It's completely done. That fills our hearts with joy. This is what we get to walk together with, brothers and sisters, the joy of knowing that Christ is our righteousness, that he is our Savior. But then, here comes the devil again, that adversary, the one against us who's, who whispers in our ears, oh, you're righteous, huh? You're saved, huh? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. All those yous and all those yours in that section, they start to make us lose sleep again, don't they? We make mistakes. We sin. We sin daily. Do I always get up in the morning and exude glory? I don't. Do you? Okay. Phew. <laughs> that means we're all in the same boat here. <laughs> okay. And, and then Satan says, look, you don't, remember, you don't resemble anything splendorous, glorious, you're none of this stuff. You're none of these things. 
How could God possibly lift you up and hold you in his hand like a royal diadem, like, like a symbol of, of what makes him glorious? Why would he do that with you, Christian? And then the answer to the, to the devil's accusations to our sleepless musing, does God really like me? The answer is yes, he has to. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. Now those are some funny words, right? Hephzibah, Beulah. Hephzibah means my delight is in her, right? My delight is in her. And so God tells us that his delight is in his people. Beulah means married, that he's connected to his people, that he will not make this connection go away. And so we look and we see, we see his righteous life, the righteous life of Christ given for us. And we look and we see what it took to save us. We, we look back on what the people of Isaiah's day were looking forward to, this Savior, this Jesus who would come and, and give us salvation and give us righteousness. And we look back, and because of this relationship that God has with us, we see our sins forgiven. We see our sins of what? Our sins of focusing on self, fo focusing on self and the, the fact that I think my relationship with God is completely determined by me and my worth when he tells us here that it's precisely because of who he is and what he has done that we are righteous and that we are saved. It's all his doing. And so the relief comes. He's done it all. He saved us through and through. God has saved us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. That's what he does. And then Satan cannot whisper anything in our ear to take that away. Because God does not change. God has given us salvation. He's given us righteousness in Christ. We have not been left desolate. We have not been put out into the wilderness to, to be on our own. No, the delight of the Lord is in us. He delights in you. You're not on your own. You're always with your God. He's with you wherever you go. And then he compares our relationship to that of a bride and a bridegroom the relationship that we have with one another and also the relationship that we have with our God. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Now, it seems strange to have the children marry the mother, right? But here's the point. This is not an improper relationship that we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the fact that every generation is going to be connected. Every generation of these believers in the Holy Christian Church are going to be connected. And then that beautiful body of believers is going to be connected to whom? To her bridegroom, to Christ. And we have that beautiful picture in the New Testament of, of Jesus being the head of the church and the church is his bride. We are a beautiful bride of Christ. You don't have to lose sleep at night. You don't have to lose sleep at night wondering if God likes you. You don't have to worry about that. You're the bride of Christ. And he loves you. He more than likes you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he loves you because of who he is. So that love will never, ever go away. And then he tells us that he gives us this new name in this reading, and that's the part that I haven't touched on yet, the new name. What is this new name? It's not in the reading. But if you go to the end of the chapter, he tells us what the new name is. 
And what's amazing about this is he, he just can't wait to tell us how much he delights in us, how much he loves us, that he holds off on telling us that new name until the very end. He holds us on tanner hooks until, until the end. And then he tells us that new name. Here it is. This is what God calls you and me, holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. That's who we are. Since we know God likes us, more than likes us, that God loves us, and he loves us so much that he calls us holy, which means set apart, which means a saint, right? And he calls us redeemed, that we've been bought back from any sin, all sin. Our God has that relationship with us. We then can do what Psalm 4 says, one of my favorite psalms. Here's the last verse. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Lie down and sleep in peace. And that safety that we have, that, that extends to our insecurities about whether people like us or not, too. We hear in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Fellow redeemed, fellow saints of God, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord, God rejoices in you. He rejoices in you. He delights in you. He loves you. And so we do that for each other too. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus the Lord unto life everlasting. Amen.